So I'm just working, like I was telling Ron off of the viewer, um, because I didn't, you know, make the, the pull request yet, because I keep finding errors. So, um, okay, is the font good, sound good? Uh, everything's good to me. Yeah. Same here, okay. all good. Sounds good, okay. So um, we're doing chapter five today, resampling methods, and um, I've added some learning objectives. So the big picture here is we're gonna learn about two resampling methods. One is cross-validation and then the bootstrap, right? And so both of these ref refit a model to samples formed from the training set. And this is to obtain additional information about the fitted model, right? So for example, cross-validation provides estimates of the test set prediction error, right? And the bootstrap is generally for standard deviation and bias of parameter estimates or, or some sort of estimator of uncertainty in, in a parameter estimate. So remember that the training error rate is often quite different, right, from the test error rate and can dramatically underestimate it. So I got this off of the slides on the ISLR website. And so remember, uh, based on model complexity, where you have low and then high here on the right hand side, this is the prediction error for the training sample. And as model complexity increases, that decreases very, very much, right? And so, but the, the test error rate does not, and it shows this uh, kind of characteristic inverted U curve, right? And this is um, having to do with, um, you know, on this end, you have high bi bias, but very low variance. And as model complexity increases, you have low bias, but very high variance. And those are the two things that we're working on when optimizing these things. Um, so the best solution really is to have a large test set, right? But that's not often available. And so there are methods like the AIC and BIC, which I haven't researched as much. Maybe you guys are familiar with it, but those make mathematical adjustments to the training error in order to estimate the test error rate, right? But here we're looking at methods that actually estimate the test error by holding out a subset of the training observations from the fitting or training process. And then you apply the statistical learning method to the held out observations, right? So in this chapter, we're gonna use a validation set to estimate the test error of a predictive model. Uh, same for leave one out cross validation and then similar K fold cross validation. And then we'll use the bootstrap to obtain standard errors of an estimate in our example. And then um, also kind of briefly describe the advantages and disadvantages of various methods for estimating this model test error, also known as the prediction error. Okay, so the validation set approach, um, this pretty much involves, you know, randomly splitting the data into a training set and validation set. Um, and also note that in certain applications, such as like time series analysis, it's not feasible to just randomly split the data, right? And I'm assuming because these are ordered uh, by time. So the advantage of the validation set approach is that it's very conceptually simple to understand and to implement, right? But the validation error rate is very variable because this depends on the assignment of the training and the validation set. So which data points went to where, right? So additionally, we are giving up valuable data points because we're not using all the data to estimate the model, right? So the validation error rate is going to tend to overestimate the test error rate. So um, here is figure 5.2, right? And so you see here um, on the left, the validation set approach used to estimate the test mean squared error here on the y-axis from predicting miles per gallon as a polynomial function of horsepower. And that's from the, I think, auto or cars data set, right? And you can see that um, as the degree of polynomial increases, the MSC decreases, right? Um, but if you look over here, these are different test and training splits. And I mean, look at the variability, right? Um, and that's, that's largely just a function of, you know, what data points went into each of the sets. Okay. So given that um, this leave one out cross validation uh, aims to address some of these drawbacks and um, it's very similar to the validation set approach, but um, so you also split into a training set and a validation set, but the validation set includes only one uh, observation, hence the name, right? You leave one out. And the training set includes all of the others. And so um, you repeat this process for all of the observations that you have, right? So that you estimate N models. And so with this approach, you have a large training set, right? And that avoids the problems of not using almost all of the data for fitting the model, right? Um, but 
the error is going to be highly variable because it consists of only one observation, right? Although it is uh, largely unbiased. And so I think unbiased here means that it's almost a perfect fit, right, for the model. You're just leaving out one observation from the training data. And the leave one out cross validation estimate of the test error is an average across over all of the n models and is given by this formula, right? So this is just the average of the difference between the data point and the estimated, so the squared error. Um, okay, we good up to there? Very good, yeah, very clear. No problem. So what are the advantages of this leave one out cross validation over this validation set approach that we saw at the very beginning? So there are several advantages, right? So it has a lot less bias since the models are repeatedly fitted on slightly different data sets, right? So it tends to not overestimate the test error as much as this validation set approach. Um, and also the test error is almost always going to be the same, right? Um, when it's performed on the entire data set. Okay, I don't know if they mean, okay, well, whatever that means. Okay, the major disadvantage, right, of leave one out cross valley computationally expensive because you're fitting all of these models, right? But there's a special case where you can save some computational power. And so this is for least squares linear or polynomial regression, right? You can use this formula and it makes the cost of estimating all of these uh, models the same as for a single model fit. And essentially this is almost the same, but here you are normalizing or dividing by this uh, term here, where H1 is the leverage, right? For a given residual. And this was defined earlier in chapter three. And this is for a simple linear regression. So this value of H1 falls between one over N. And so any observations whose residuals have high leverage will contribute to relatively more to the CV statistic. Okay. Um, in general, uh, leave one out cross validation can be used for various kinds of models, right? Including many of the ones that we've already seen. So all of the linear regressions and then the GLMs that we went over for classification. I think, okay. Sandra, what they meant when they said yeah. that they are, the test area is always the same is simply that there's no randomness involved. You just, the, the estimated test area is always going to be the same number because with the same data that is, right? There's yeah, no random, yeah, you're, not, yeah, yeah. you're not randomly selecting anything, you're just going to use it, leaving one out sequentially. That's true. So that can't add a whole lot to it. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. That's all they're saying. Thank you. All righty. Okay, so K-fold cross-validation is an alternative to this leave one out cross-validation. And this just involves dividing the data set into K groups or folds, right? And approximately they're all equal size. So the percent of the data set that is in the validation set can be thought of as one over K, right? So for example, if you have a K equal to five groups, then 20% of the data would be withheld for testing. So I think this is where that 80-20 division might come from. But so hold on to that thought. Um, so just a graphical illustration of the K-fold approach, right? You're dividing into equal parts and then um, you're using one of the folds as, a, as your test set, right? Um, so this leave one out cross-validation is actually a special case of K-fold cross-validation where your K was equal to N, right? And then the equation for the cross-validation error rate for um, the K-fold approach is given by one over K and uh, average of the mean squared error. Okay, so, so what are the advantages of this K-fold cross-validation over leave one out, right? So the main advantage is computational, right? But there are other advantages that are related to the bias variance trade-off, right? So in the figure below, you have we have the true test error for the simulated data sets from chapter two. So, and I think that was just fitting different polynomial functions to different data sets that they had simulated. Um, and so here you can see that the estimated test errors, uh, uh, let me see. So the true test error for this specific data set, right, is shown in blue. And that's that inverted U typical shape for the test error. The leave one out cross validation error is this dash black line, right? And the tenfold cross validation error is orange. So definitely underestimating it in this first panel, right? But 
not terrible. And then um, for different data sets, it just looks a little bit better. The one thing that the book did sort of mention was that even though sometimes it overestimates and or underestimates some of the models, right? It gets pretty close to detecting the true, you know, like flexibility of which model to use, for example, if you're fitting polynomials, right? So if this is the true test error and it's about polynomial five, this is, I mean, a little bit higher, but probably it's not as variable through those degrees of polynomials, like as in the mean squared is not gonna increase that much. Um, yeah, okay, so what is this bias variance trade-off, right, for this k-fold cross-validation? So the validation approach, right, where you're just dividing randomly into training and testing uh, tends to overestimate the true test error, but there is low variance in the estimate since we have just one estimate of the test error. Okay, so this was actually in the book down, and I'm not entirely sure. I think that, I mean, the statement is true, but one estimate of the test error just doesn't explain uh, why there would be low variance, right? There is just one estimate of the variance. So how can it be low or high? So I, I'm not entirely sure if this statement is correct, um, but let's just keep going. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, um, please you know, uh, pipe up. Um, conversely, the leave one out cross validation method has very little bias, right? Since you're using all but one observation to create the model. Um, but this leave one out cross validation sort of doesn't shake up the data enough, right? The estimates for each of the CV of the end models are highly correlated, right? And so the mean can have a high variance. And in the book, they just explain that as correlated, I guess, um, whatever it is, if you have high correlations, then things tend to have high variance. I'm not entirely sure why that is. Um, but that was their explanation. So a better choice to this uh, leave one out cross validation is using uh, k-fold cross validations with k equals five or k equals 10, right? So this is often used in modeling because it has been empirically demonstrated to yield results that do not have either too much bias or variance. And so uh, remember we were talking about the 80-20. I think this is probably where that idea comes from. So that would be a k equals five. Um, we're using a 80-20 split of the data. Okay, shall we move on from this slide? Um, I, I just had a couple of thoughts about the, uh, the, especially that second uh, high variance point. Um, uh -huh. I was actually gonna, that was the one question I was gonna bring up. Uh, should I discuss it now or should we? Uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. We have time. Yeah, I had questions about that too. And I, I was thinking about it and trying to imagine what it means intuitively. And I think I think it makes sense in the sense that like, um, if you have a bunch of observations that kind of all move together, mm -hmm. if, if one of them, if like sample to sample, uh, kind of like, um, I don't know, like, like there's something different about the sample that all kind of move together um, and, the the mean the means will like shift a lot depending on the characteristics of the data you have like I guess like mm -hmm. I don't know that's how I was thinking about it um like the relationship between high correlation and, and the means having high variance um right right yeah. because there would be some kind of trend right in the mm -hmm. like okay yeah, I yeah, think I mean I mean I think like the other part of it is like looking at a formula and like trying to figure out what, why that's true. But I think, I don't know, I was trying to get an intuitive explanation. I think, I think that makes sense to me, but uh, I don't know. I was wondering what other people thought about that. Right. I, I can only confirm that I also, I found this section clear as mud, so to speak. Um, and I kind of hoped that it wasn't too important. I have a complete understanding of it to continue on because I don't know that I will get a complete understanding. Like I have a very shallow understanding of what they're saying. Yeah, sure. I kind of get that, you know, the correlation between the different estimates of the error is gonna cause that to have uh, you know, more variance, but how exactly that happens, not not so much. Right, 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 right. So I can only say that I join you in confusion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And then the first the first low variance point and the first uh -huh. bullet. Um 
I don't know. My, my only thought is like, if you have repeated samples from the population and then you're doing this cross validation approach, um, mm -hmm. just that if you have a, just a one validation test set and you're just doing a train test split and a single test set, then mm -hmm. you just have more data. And so there's going to be less variance sample to like kind of test set to test set. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's the only thought I have on that. <laughs> Um, so like it's a more stable, stable, uh, set of data, or it's like close, more closely resembling the population. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe I totally misunderstood then. So, okay. So this validation set approach would have been dividing, say that you divide the data in half, right? So you have 50% to train and then 50% to test, right? Your prediction error. And you would do that. I guess you would do that repeatedly yeah, I don't, I don't, or no? I don't know what they mean. I thought they meant by the validation approach, just a single validation set. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not that anyone really you does that, but, uh, you know, or at least in terms of choosing a model, you would, you know, do the case, like, I, I don't know, I've never heard anyone just like training once, but. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Because then the thing that I'm describing would be like a K of two, right? But you could repeat that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you'd still have, I think, in most cases, like a test set that you would uh, evaluate the final model that you choose mm -hmm. on, um, but that you would do kind of K fold cross validation on the train set, um, to, in order to choose the best model and the best parameters and everything. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so let's uh my cursor go. Okay, next slide. Um okay, so cross validation on classification problems. So we've been looking at the regression setting, right? Where y is quantitative, but you can also use this cross validation for classification problems where y is qualitative. Um and so here you use the number of misclassified observations instead of the mean squared error, right? To quantify the test error. And the leave one out cross validation error rate takes the form um, in this equation. And the error is just, uh, what is the sign? Like, I guess the set of observations where you're misclassifying, right? So where your prediction is not the actual value. Um, forget what capital I means, but. It's indicator. Indicator. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like one or zero or something. Yeah. Okay. It turns true or false into one or zero. <laughs> mm, okay. That makes sense. Um, okay. So these are just some examples, right, of logistic polynomial regression based decision boundaries and uh, k fold cross validations for some of these data sets, right? Um, so these are just different degrees of polynomials fit to, hey, Kevin, it's your uh, orange is blueberries. <laughs> I just realized that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here they're showing uh, estimated decision boundaries of different, you know, polynomial re re logistic regression models for simulated data, right? And uh, the base decision boundary is the dash purple line. So in practice, you know, the true test error and the Bayes error rate are unknown. So we need to estimate the test error rates. Um, so this can be done via K-fold cross-validation, uh, which is often a good estimate of the true test error. So here um, on the left-hand side, I think this is just the, yeah, 10-fold cross-validation error, right? So the test error here is in beige. Uh, the training error rate is in blue. And what is black? Oh, the tenfold uh, cross validation error rate is in black. Oh, got it. Sorry. So this is for polynomial logistic regression, and this is for KNN classification. So I guess it's actually not bad. Um, yeah, again, underestimating a bit, but it's not awfully bad. Um, okay, so now on to this final section on the bootstrap, right? So the bootstrap can be used in a wide variety of modeling frameworks to estimate the uncertainty associated with a given estimator. 
So for example, the bootstrap is useful to estimate the standard errors of the coefficients for a linear regression, right? You can also get a bootstrap confidence interval for the parameters. And it essentially involves repeated sampling with replacement from the original data set to form a distribution of the statistic in question. Okay, so I sort of expanded this last slide to give a little bit more context. So it's just a simple bootstrap example. This is directly from the text, right? So uh, the example is that we want to invest a fixed sum of money into financial assets that yield returns of X and Y respectively, right? And so we're gonna invest a fraction of our money alpha into X and invest the rest Y minus alpha into Y. So because there is some variability associated with the returns on the two assets, we want to choose alpha, right, to minimize the total risk or the variance of our investment. So this is essentially what we want to minimize, the variance of A times X plus one minus alpha uh, Y, right? So the value of alpha that minimizes the risk is given by this, right, equation. And then these are just, um, these terms are just, uh, the variance of x, the variance of y, and the covariance of x, y. So these quantities right here are actually unknown, right? But we can estimate them from a data set that contains measurements of x and y. So the first thing that they do in the book is sort of simulate 100 pairs of data points x, y from like the original true population. So they do this four times, right? And then they got different four values of uh, alpha hat, so the estimate, that range from 0 0.532 to 0 0.657, right? So now we wanna know like, great, so, but how accurate, right? Is this as an estimate of the true alpha, right? So what you can do is you can get the standard deviation of this estimate, right? So you run the exact same simulation as above, but you do it a thousand times, and now you get a thousand values of alpha hat, so a thousand estimates for alpha. They knew the true value of alpha to be 0 0.6, right? And then if you take the mean overall, a thousand estimates of alpha, those alpha hats, right? Uh, it comes out to 0 0.596, so it's really, really close, right? And if you then compute the standard deviation for the estimate, which is given by this equation, it uh, returns 0 0.083. So this actually gives a fairly good estimate of the accuracy of alpha, right? Because we expect our alpha hats to differ from alpha by around 0 0.08, okay? So for real data though, right? We cannot generate new samples from, from the true population. I mean, that would be great if you could just get more samples, but oftentimes that is not the case, right? So in this case is where you wanna use the bootstrap, sorry. So here you can see, uh, this is like the true distribution of the mean of alpha, right? From a thousand samples that were taken from the true population. And there, this pink line is alpha, right? And in the middle, you see the bootstrap distribution, right? So a thousand samples taken from the original sample, right? Not from the true population. And the estimate for alpha is pretty similar as it almost as if you had generated more samples from the true population. And then um, here on the far right, you have uh, the variability of alpha and the spread is very, very similar between the two. So the bootstrap and the true population distribution. So they look very similar and with very comparable estimates for alpha, which is really nice. Okay. And then finally, uh, how to compute this bootstrap standard error, right? So the bootstrap standard error functions as an estimate of the standard error of the alpha hat, the estimated from the original data set. And it's given by this equation below, right? Um, so B is the number of bootstrap samples. So a thousand times, this is how we did it. The asterisk here indicates that it's a boost bootstrap estimate of alpha hat, right? And then this term, one over B, uh, the sum of R prime to B um, of alpha hat asterisk R prime is just the mean of this term. So it came out to about 0 0.087 in our example, right? And then if you compare this to the estimate that we obtain using actual like true new samples, from the true population, it's very similar in the estimate. And actually the equations, after I looked at them, I'm like, okay, this is almost exactly the same because this is just the mean 
of alpha, and this is also the mean, right, for this specific, um, for alpha hat. So, yeah, I think that that was it. The, yeah, the rest is lab. So, I'm going to stop share. And we are actually half an hour early. So, so next time is the lab. Are you going to cover that part or is... Um, no one's not signed up yet. Looked at it. Yeah. I, I can't because I'm going to be traveling. I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to make the meeting, but I can try. Um, if it's not super long, um, the other thing that I was thinking was, um, if we each work on it and then, you know, bring up something to talk about that either you had a question on or a problem on or. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I like that uh, approach. Okay. Because it the seems kind of, fairly simple. The B, was it uh, BYOQ, bring your own question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I like yeah. that a lot. Uh, is that okay with everyone else? Yeah, it works for me too. Okay, thank you for being flexible. I, I can try and prepare something, you know, but I don't know how much time I'd have to like actually go through the whole thing and then. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, I just put that in there as uh, bring your own questions. Um, yeah, really awesome job, Sandra. This is great. Yeah, it was a very short, fairly straightforward um, <laughs> chapter, so I was super excited. And then I learned how to do all of this uh, formatting in R with for all of the equations, which took me a long time, but I'm glad I, I did it. So, yeah. One thing I, uh, one thought I had about the bootstrap that I was curious what you guys thought about was, um, I don't know, whenever I hear about bootstrap approaches, like to estimating, you know, error, I, uh, in like, uh, you know, an estimate or something, um, or a pram, you know, or in a, uh, coefficient, um, I think like it must be really important to have your uh, to be sure that your sample that you're doing that from is a representative sample. Because like I feel like bootstrap more than anything else can like like exacerbate some kind of bias if it's in the data set, you know. Um, at least that's like how it feels to me when I read about it. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually if it actually has more. Well, it's you know, important potential for bias, but for other contexts, but it just yeah. feels like because you're sampling over and over again, like it it could uh, kind of make that that uh, that bias louder or just it seems that way to me but um uh, also sorry, yeah. it's very important that the samples are independent I mean, that's the assumption um if there is some hidden dependence between your samples that's a problem too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. independently distributed or whatever the word is iid what is it yeah and uh and yeah i guess just independent right independent observations I Independent and identically. Or identically, like that. that's it. That's like yeah. I couldn't think of I was. Yeah. <laughs> I see. It's IID, right? So they always forget where they had letters there. Yeah, IID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah independent, identically. Yeah. 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 I guess the other thing in um. Well, you're assuming over... that the you're assuming that the dis you're basically taking the sample distribution as the truth distribution, right? That's like just imagine like little delta yeah. functions at each sample point, and so that so anything that where that's not a good assumption, <laughs> you know. Right, 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 right. yeah, yeah. There's actually quite a bit about this on the Wikipedia page, which I highly recommend looking at. There's a Wikipedia page on this resampling. For bootstrapping? Oh, okay. I bootstrapping, sorry, yeah. I'll check that out. Can I yeah, hear my screen quickly? Uh, Okay, yeah. ahead, Sandra. Uh, there was just something that I, that was super, that was kind of relevant um, to this chapter, and I just it came across it on Twitter, and I thought it was kind of neat. Um, can you guys see this? Um, yeah. This is a tweet about reproducibility and machine learning research, um, and like reproduce. It's talking about like a reproducibility reproducibility crisis in machine learning, just like everything else, I guess, is a reproducibility crisis, and. Um, and then they, he like kind of gave the screenshot of this review of these different papers from different fields. And I was trying to make it bigger. Let me actually uh, see if I can open it in another tab uh, and then zoom. Okay, there we go. Oh, cool. 
so uh so there's different fields right and these different papers and years and you know all within the last 10 years it looks like or five years even um except for this one and uh and they, they talk they have listed here what the pitfalls are and i thought it was super interesting like they're all pretty much like either about uh you know validation sets or like leakage between the two sets um so it's like no train test split no train test split duplicates across the train test split sampling bias pre-processing on train test sets together no train test split temporal leakage duplicate across train test split non independence between train and test sets sieve selection on tra train and test no train test no train test split you know it, it's it's like all about these, uh, um, you know, this this kind of problem that if you don't do this kind of uh, this, uh, yeah, this uh, this methodology well with you know uh, train train test splits and you know training on just your train set and evaluating on a kind of a held out set, then um, you, you can have problems for for reproducing those findings. Um, I wonder what temporal leakage is. Sounds like yeah. something happens on Back to the Future. I think it might. <laughs> I think it. Yeah, I think it just might be like uh, in a time series data set. Um, if you're like forecasting or something, I would guess. Um, and you're 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 grabbing data from the future and your train set, and then you're forecasting. So like you you don't you don't like uh, have. You don't predict. You don't train on historical and pre predict on the later observations. Does that make sense? I think that's what that means. So, like you, you have like a mixture of like past and future, or past and present, or whatever. Like whatever you're, like you're not. Uh, like ideally, I think in time series forecasting, you have a method where your training and test sets are non-overlapping in terms of time. And and your your training on uh, all your training data is, is before your test data in time. Because mm. if not, then you then you're you know what's going to happen in the future in your in your train set, right? And then if you're forecasting, you're kind of cheating. Um, uh, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, you can predict. It's predicting the future in some sense. <laughs> exactly. Like if you already know the future in yeah. the train set, then it doesn't. It's not a true forecast. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, scenario. that's interesting. Yeah. Like there's a there, there's a um here, time series cross like the time series cross validation. There's some good graphs. So like you would do something like this where, um, where you you do uh you kind of like build up your. Oh you build up your train set over time and then your test set is always like the last the month. Yeah. Um, and then you, and then this is how you do cross validation. Cool. Yeah. Kevin, would you mind going back to the previous screen that you were showing with the That's results? Fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So this is um, each of these, for example, is this field paper, right? So in this paper, the, for the field of medicine, bow, meester, whatever, right? So within this specific, I'm guessing, meta review, they looked at 71 papers and then found 27 with pitfalls and the pitfalls was largely no train test split. I think so, yeah, I think that's okay. right. So yeah, they seemed like, yeah, there have to be some sort of meta analysis, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah. Would you mind clicking on, can you scroll down and then go to mm -hmm. something like, um, maybe this uh, neuropsychiatry, can you click on that poll track? Is it a link? Uh, I think maybe in this here. Oh. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, neuropsychiatry. Yeah. Oh, I think that's Russ poll track. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll press back to this for evidence. Okay. Number of neuroaging summit studies. So it seems like they're reviewing a bunch of papers and then offering recommendations for how to improve uh, yeah, 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 yeah. the disability. Okay, okay. So I guess this website might be like a, a kind of a, a meta meta analysis. <laughs> You know, yes, 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 uh, yes. So they're seeing by field. 
I'm just looking at, you know, some of it is not looking good. Like, uh, especially like, uh, you know, this neuropsychiatry, like half of them, right, are showing some kind of a pitfall. Oh, yeah. Right I don't here. think this trained test splitting is as universally used in science as it is, for example, in some of the softer sciences, I guess. I can, so the harder the science, the less likely people use this trained test. I've never even heard. I mean, all my career as a physicist, I've never used any kind of cross validation. You know, we just, but of course, it's different. We're fitting scientific models and it's like mm -hmm, looking for mm -hmm. parameters and scientific models and you're judging the validity of the scientific model on other criteria, not on that kind of cross validation approach. It's kind of like the next experiment will test it, right? So, yes, use yes. you're more likely to use like goodness of chi square type things to evaluate the model rather than, um, mm -hmm. you know, how unlikely is this fit kind of thing, not cross validation. Type. It's, I don't even think it's hard to imagine how you even use cross. Thinking back on it, it's hard for me to imagine how I would ever use cross validation in that context. So, I don't think it's fair necessarily for all of these, these no test train split. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't use this kind of cross validation for mm -hmm. some types of things, right? Yeah, I think this is ML. These are ML papers, though. Um, I think. Uh, oh, oh, okay. It's like are this they... reproducibility ML based science. I know, but now I feel like this. What is happening in the world is that the the ML is like broadening. It's anything like a curve fit is a machine learning thing all of a sudden, right? So I I feel like. <laughs> yeah. And it's partly the people in these fields fall too because they want to see relevant. Like, oh, I'm doing machine learning. I'm not doing curve fitting, so. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm learning my parameters, not fitting them, you know? So yeah, that might be yeah. just be my own bias, of course, but yeah, because I'm old. That's my oldness. <laughs> <I'm showing. laughs> no, I, I think that you're right. That it also varies by field. Like for example, like um, I am working on bioinformatics, right? And so, I mean, there's a lot of parameters that you can set every which way, you know what I mean? But you have to validate with a different technique. And so oftentimes just publishing, you know, like bioinformatic results on a data set um, is not, uh, I mean, you can publish it as a, as a resource, right? But it's not gonna be high impact. So it's sort of like, a, you would need follow-up studies to really see, okay, so these are the genes that we found and it says, you know, this function is affected. Now you have to test it, right? Some, somehow. Yeah. So usually like in a cell line or in an animal model or something. And so that sort of validates sense. independently like the bioinformatic analysis. But you know, there are fields like, for example, um, I don't want to point fingers either, but like uh, psychology or stuff like that, where, you know, you have, tons of predictors like observations. Um, it could be, you know, like you're looking at educational attainment in, you know, schools and everything is, you know, embedded within classrooms. And so, yeah, you, so it's, it's like a whole bunch of things that then you can't really test somewhere else. And yeah. so I guess, you know, that's where, you know, that like you have to be really, really proper in evaluating your models and your fit and how you do like all of this cross validation to get estimates of, you know, is it really, you know, measuring what it is that you say it's measuring. Um, so, yeah, yeah because otherwise, like, unless you can generate another whole test set or more data points, and oftentimes it's very time consuming and very expensive, um, I'm guessing it's just relying on, on the modeling as opposed to, yeah, a, a separate test validation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe some of what we're saying too is the difference in some cases between like an inference problem and a prediction problem, mm -hmm. like, like, um, like if you're just trying to understand the effect of a single factor on an outcome, you know, maybe that's a different, I'm just trying to think like what does cross validation give you? And that, I guess it's saying like with repeated sampling, does that effect hold up? or like how, how variable is that effect? I think that's a good um, point. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the difference. Because there are other ways to evaluate models rather than cross validations. Right, way. right. Or, or I think in like the social sciences, a lot of the time it's like, okay, let's run a bigger study with more people and try to see if it still applies, it still holds up. And um, I think like that's the, the validation approach for, for inference. Um, a lot of the time, but um, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, 
Um, it's interesting. Like I think like the stuff we talked about in this chapter is largely geared around situations where you want to make the best predictions you possibly can, and you're just you have a, a few models that you can, that are candidates, and you want to choose the best one that is going to work well in unseen data. You know, um, and like it makes a whole lot of sense for that kind of scenario, and it's a little bit I think fuzzier if you have different goals, maybe. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the other thing I think is cool is that um, when I saw that review that uh, I think a lot of those problems, it's, it's really hard to make those errors when you're using tidy models. Uh, I think it's like built, it's like built so you, like it's, it's almost impossible to make errors like that. Um, you know, the way the workflows work and, um, uh the way it like trains on like it it kind of computes like the, does a pre-processing on train sets and stuff and it's really easy to set up a workflow where you 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 you're, you never touch the test set at all um oh. and i think that's like one one advantage until the end and uh i think it's one advantage of um using tidy models as uh like i think they talk about like trying to bake in good statistical practice to the API and the, you know how the workflow kind of goes and I think that's one area where it's really strong um, with like our sample there's a package called our sample um, it works with that to um, um, you know do it do a, a split and then kind of you and then you do kind of everything you know the k fold everything uh, however doing cross validation all on that train set you you pre process and bake uh, you know and, and like train the pre-processing if you need to do any training on that, um, you know, all on that on that test set or train set, sorry. Um, and then you use those like pre-computed values to, you know, if you're going to do uh, if you once you do go do the predictions. Um, so anyway, I think it I think it makes it makes it makes it really hard to make errors like that. Um, which uh, that's interesting. Is, is yeah. part of their goal. Um, but I was like kind of surprised. I was looking for, I was looking at some of the lab questions. And one of the things I noticed, we could talk about it next week, but um, uh, I guess like, uh, oh, I, oh, never mind. I missed it. I thought that they were doing their kind of cross validation on, um, oh, I guess so like for leave one out cross validation. That, so they're doing it on the entire auto data set, um, mm. which I didn't expect. Like I thought they would still do a train test split and then do leave one out cross validation on the entire train set. Um, I don't know. It just seems weird to me that you're that you're doing cross validation on and you don't have any test set that like let's say you do leave one out cross validation you choose. The right level of flexibility in your model what where do you like what do you use for your final about like prediction like like uh evaluation of the error of that model that you choose you know you don't have any data left well the leave one out does give you an error estimate that seems like it's pretty good right, it's right. They use compared oh, to right. compared to k-fold and everything else right yeah actually this the i guess I like might be got, better in some yeah they said k-fold was better in many cases yeah. but they in the lab they do leave one out leave one out is a k-fold just leaving out but even one, right yeah but even in but even in k, -fold, k -fold. in this in this in the lab right. in the k in k-fold they're still using the entire data set for k-fold yeah. which is weird to me. Oh, that's how the book oh okay well that's not this is my only experience with this so okay. that made sense to me so it's not weird to me but if you have some other sources that they actually take a set, yeah. a, a training set, and they k-fold on that. So it's like another yeah. split now. And now you're doing a two, exactly. 20, now you're doing a split to five on that. And then when you're done with all that, then you do it on another extra yeah. set leftover like the, out. That makes sense when you say it. When, when you're talking about when I was talking about the tiny models approach, like a lot of their oh. examples are are like that. So like you like pretty much everything they do, you always do a training and test split and then you do all your cross validation, all your model tuning, everything you want to do, you know, on the k fold within that train. And then if you choose a final model, then you fit 
on the entire train set with that final model, and then you evaluate that on test data. Oh, so it's like a multi-step process. Interesting. Exactly, exactly. So like you benefit in the end from the entire train set in terms of the the um uh like the model training part, like you're using the entire 80% or whatever. Um <clears throat> In or, and then before you do your predictions on the test set. Um, but I guess that's not how everyone does it. Um, I just assume that's like kind of what the workflow is in general. Um, but no, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, yeah. I wonder if the Essentials book has something to say about that. The advanced book, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> this sounds like an advanced way to do it, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Yeah, but like, but like, I, the like tidy models even has a function called final fit, where you you give it your your train data, whatever with like the folds, and it'll it'll just it'll train it on the entire data set at once, um, uh, on the entire train set. Um, so it's definitely like is opinionated. <laughs> in that yeah. Um, um, but. Uh, Anyway, I just I just saw that and I was like, oh, that's different. Uh, um, but there's probably strong opinions about it and uh, arguments for both approaches. I don't really. I tell you one thing. It, it you know, I don't want to digress too far on this, but I like that in one way because the cross validation is kind of technical, right? So you do all that to pick your model, then you just do, and then you you know you still would document this in your paper, but then there's like this, the next part you can just conclude with. Now we look at a test set that we've held out to see how well this does. It's very easy to, um, what's it trying to say? Is it really easy to lean on that, right? It's very easy to use that as an argument, right? Because this is right. like totally pristine, untouched test data. Exactly. Now we're going to look at it. You know, you know, that way people understand cross-validation and the rest. They could definitely understand this, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I like it, too, because it feels like you can do whatever the heck you want with that train data, you know, right. like, like you can, you can, you know, if you, if you really overfit it, you're going to be in trouble, you know, when you, when you go into that test set. Um, yeah. Hmm. Kevin, just out of curiosity, um, uh -huh. is tiny models always working with very large data sets with lots of observations? Because I'm like, so to to save, you know, a, a test set test set that is just pristine and then have it seems like a luxury, right? Um, yeah. I'm just wondering you know, how this yeah. does for you know when you it have few observations. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't you don't have to have a lot of observations. And like you don't oh, okay. have to do you don't have to do even K full cross validation or you know, you can just do a train test split and then uh -huh. and then and then train on um train on you know, fitted on the train set, but like, but it, I think when you start getting into models with hyperparameters and like a large number uh, of them, and it's yeah, like yeah, a really, yeah, yeah. it's like a really, yeah. really big space that you have to explore and find the best right. performance, you know? So I think just by the nature of those models, like if you want to get anywhere close to the best hyperparameter combination, you mm -hmm. need like, you need, you know, a bunch of folds. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you have ten parameters and they could take on, you know, ten thousand different combinations, like, uh, um, you know, you're gonna and like I don't know, I yeah, I, I feel like I'm selling tiny models over like right now, but um, but they also have some really cool stuff where um, yeah, these like uh, Bayesian um, what is it called? Uh, they have this like simulated annealing and Bayesian optimization where like you can you can like uh, uh, basically give it a starting place and it'll like explore the sp hyperparameter space kind of like on its own and like try something and it starts to degrade the error to like go back a couple steps and then go oh. forward. And it's really, it's really, they have some cool stuff. Um, um, yeah, in addition to like the traditional like grid search type of approach, but. Wait, did you say gradient descent? No, it's like, there's like a, Sim uh, it's like a, he said it's simulated annealing. Simulated, kind of simulated annealing, yeah. That's where you like, you add a random, you add some randomness to your gradient descent where sometimes you don't go down, you go up. Yeah, yeah. You, know, stuck. you can control like a temperature so like it'll percolate out of a minute, a local minimum and find the real global minimum. Then you lower the temperature oh. slowly. That's the simulated yeah. annealing part. The temperature quotes, right? And then you find the global minimum that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's an really, interesting name for it, yeah. It's really cool, yeah. But, um, yeah. I haven't used that much, but... um. 
but yeah, they have the, like a Bayesian approach to it. I think where like, I think like with a lot of these, you can actually. I've used it not for this, but for oh, just okay. finding minimums, finding minimums and other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it was the first I heard of it in in when Teddy Miles uh, in the Teddy oh, okay. Miles book, but um. Um, Which book is that? That's just called Tidy Models or whatever? T, yeah, if you go to like tmwr.org, uh, I think that's okay. uh, Tidy Modeling with R. They're actually, or tmwr, yeah. Hmm. It just came oh, out yeah. with a hard, hard cover, yeah. Cool. Um, but uh, I was in the book club for that, and then I, uh, it, we, we like, we got to the end where the book was. They were like, it was like in, still being written. Um, Oh. <laughs> so we didn't i think like the chapter 16 to 21 weren't there um but uh but yeah there's some really cool like Put that on my like, list of future yeah I think that's my next uh book club they told me to go to this one first mm -hmm. okay yeah that's good to know actually um Oops. but yeah and they, they have a lot of a lot of really cool stuff. I, um, I feel like it's going to be adopted widely in like four or five years. By I, I feel like it's going to make R a lot more popular for machine learning. Um, I mean, I have played around a little bit with it, and I do like the the. I started going through with the other with the R for data science book uses it right. So even that book, I started mm -hmm. going through that a little bit. I didn't finish it, but um, does it does it use it? I didn't. Yeah, uh, I guess I guess the newest version. Yeah, the newest version does. Yeah. Yeah. that's awesome and it's kind of cool how you could pipe things together and everything like that yeah and i guess i think it, the, the complaint i've heard about it for people who don't like it or for people who have issues with it is um they don't like that it they think it's like really verbose like or like uh you have to like write a lot of code like the it's like multiple lines for i don't know they, they think it could be more concise i guess by some people um but i don't mind that i'm, I'm not like I'm not trying to do this in like 30 seconds, you know, like I'm, you know, thinking through it. And, uh, to to know, be honest, the reading speed is more important than the writing speed, in my view. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can figure out what it's doing looking at it, that's worth it. Yeah, and I think in that way, it's great because it's, yeah. you know, each step is very, like like the functions are, are very uh, like explanatory in their name, um, which, which I really like. Very cool. Yeah, maybe we can incorporate some tidy models in the uh, lab next week. I, I know there's that book that Sham used, um, or that that online resource. So maybe I'll yeah, take a look at yeah. that. I'll probably that keep like going. A, with, some I'll, good tips. Yeah, I'll probably keep going with base art because I can only learn so many things at one time. <laughs> <laughs> true. True. That's struggle true. along. <laughs> struggle along. Yeah. All right. Well, th thank you so much again. Um, uh, uh, it, was, it was fantastic, Sandra. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I was happy to do it. So bring your own questions and I'll try to prepare a, a little bit of it. So. Awesome. Yeah. No problem. All right. Okay. See you all Thanks next all. week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.